Victor, uh, this is the last session of our invited speakers in our blockchain summer internship program. So Dr. Yahya Hazanzadeh has a very successful PhD thesis uh, at Koch University. Now he's working at Canada. He kindly accepted our offer to uh, give his presentation as an invited talk. So I just give the uh, session to him. Thank you for your contribution. Thanks, Ojan. Uh, and it's my pleasure to present here. Yeah. So uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yahya Hassanza. Uh, and as uh, and so John, uh, also uh, introduced me, uh, I uh, graduated with a PhD in computer science and engineering from Koch University. And I'm currently a senior distributed system uh, engineer and architect at Dapple Labs in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, my uh, presentation title is Lightchain, which is a scalable DHC based blockchain. And this was part of my PhD thesis. Um, and also we published it as a paper and it, is, it has been filed as a patent. Uh, the co-authors on this paper are my uh, PhD supervisors, Professor Abdekin Kupchu and Professor Ruzmurus Kasa. So the, this is the outline of uh, my presentation, considering that uh, this is a presentation for summer internship, I'm taking a, a sort of tutorial approach to, to uh, present the blockchains, the uh, deficiencies uh, in scalability and what we contribute to that. Uh, first of all, uh, blockchains. Blockchains are operating on a P2P overlay of equally privileged but trustless uh, peers. And what does it mean? It means that among each pair of peers in, in a blockchain P2P system, there isn't any mutual reference of trust. So what does uh, it incur? If uh, a note uh, claims that I have some money, let's say I have a balance of uh, $5 and I want to transfer some of this to another note, maybe bargaining some of this for, for a good or commodity, uh, and claim that from now on, after this bargaining is done, my balance is $3 and your balance is $2. But then uh, what would have, what may go wrong? Well, uh, there isn't any uh, exchange of the actual uh, balance here because balance is a sort of a state in the system. So this note may turn to be malicious after uh, the, the bargain is down. Uh, the node turned to another node and says that, oh, my balance is still $5 and I, I want to also bargain with you, let's say over some, some other services. And, and it keeps uh, doing that and make the system uh, corrupted. Uh, of course, there is a centralized solution to this where we, we uh, put a database, a, a shared database in the system and uh, this database is uh, uh, shared among all the nodes. Every, every node can read or write from that. But the important thing is that this database uh, acts as a notion of trust in the system. So everyone has a trust in this database. And this database can be, let's say, a bank, for example. Then instead of directly doing this transaction, this transaction can go through the bank and because everyone has a trust in this bank, uh, whatever this bank says is correct. So this bank says that after this transaction, balance of node uh, X is let's say uh, $3 and then everyone accepts that and the, the, the problem of trust is solved. But the uh, notion of bank and the uh, centralized solution we are moving towards a fully decentralized world where we want to minimize the trust on these uh, centralized entities. So uh, the, the concept of replicated database comes into the play that instead of having this uh, database shared, uh, a single instance of the database shared among all the nodes, let's replicate this instance on all the nodes so, so we eradicate that notion of centralized bank 
or centralized uh, uh, trusted third party, and we replicate this on, on all the nodes in the system, and uh, we, we build up a replicated uh, and shared database among all the nodes. And then here, if a node uh, X wants to replay the same transaction, it broadcasts that to every node that, uh, hey all, uh, I want to uh, pay $2 from my balance to node Y, and please write it on your, uh, let's say, uh, shared replicated database. And as far as the majority of the nodes follow this, then they, uh, write down that as a transaction, they turn that transaction into a block, and they skip that, those details, and then we, uh, they append that to the uh, shared instance of the replicated database that they own on their local computer or local machine. And this is literally the, the uh, concept of the blockchain, uh, that uh, they, they can, uh, add the new transactions to, 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 to that uh, replicated uh, instance of the shared database. But uh, what's the value that, or, or what's the cash? The cash is that as long as the majority of the nodes do the right thing, they follow the right protocol, the blockchain provides some guarantees that it, it works correctly. We revisit these terms in, in, in the uh, in, in this presentation very soon. But this introduces several concerns like ordering of this block, how this should order, their causality, their consistency, and we will talk about those uh, more into detail. But before jumping into the, the details of uh, blockchain uh, architecture, I, I would like to, to review some of the uh, concepts that may act as preliminaries. The first concept is the hash function, which is, normally uh, speaking, the information fingerprint. A hash function is defined uh, from a set of arbitrary lengths of strings to a, uh, to a set of fixed length of string, uh, strings here. And then uh, on, on input, you can put any data, like a single character, as we show here, or uh, let's say, URL or a file, whatever, and it turns that into a unique random sequence of bytes or unique number of a fixed length. And what is interesting about this is that as long as the input is unique, the output is unique, and uh, although the, the input might be deterministic, but the output distribution is totally uniform and uh, randomized. And also, in, in the concept of the blockchain, we are interested about collision resistant hash functions, meaning that two different uh, inputs result in two different outputs. Or even in, in other words, if you change a single bit of this uh, input, it results in a totally different output with a very high probability. Uh, then uh, this is the concept of ledger. Uh, which is an append-only chain of the blocks where each block consists of a set of transactions and it has a previous field and that previous field points to the collision resistant hash value of its previous block in the uh, ledger. So it forms uh, such a data structure that uh, there is uh, the, the initial block that normally is called genesis block and this is the only notion of trust in the system, and we will talk about that, why this is the case, and because literally it doesn't introduce any benefits to the system, so everyone can just trust on a sequence of bits and, and doesn't harm the system in any way. Uh, then blocks are coming after that, so we have the first block that points to the genesis as previous block, we have the second block uh, which points to the first block, as a previous block, and uh, each block consists of, of course, a set of transactions. And we can make new blocks uh, by uh, creating a block and uh, establishing this uh, previous pointer. So uh, before uh, block three coming into the play, uh, block two was the current tail of the blockchain, but uh, once block three comes, it, it becomes the new tail. So we have the genesis, on, uh, and, and 
the tail has two ends of the ledger and the blockchain is developed or the ledger is developed at, at the, uh, from, uh, from its uh, tail side. Uh, and the interesting thing about this data structure is that it is immutable, meaning that no update or delete is supported. So what happens if I uh, change a single transaction here, even a single bit of a single transaction, it results in a totally different hash for the entire block following the collision resistant uh, property and the, the randomness property of the hash functions. And then this link is no longer valid. So no one can attribute this block to the previous block. And we assume uh, the existence of an adversarial uh, party. We consider adversary as a single party. This is a very strong assumption, uh, meaning that there is one uh, 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 interest for the adversary in, in the system, but it can corrupt several nodes. And we will talk about the fraction of nodes that it can corrupt. It can corrupt those nodes, meaning that those nodes no longer follow the code, the, the instructions of the blockchain protocol, and they can arbitra do, do arbitrary tasks in the system. Uh, so having hash function ledger and adversary reviewed, uh, now we can uh, jump into the uh, blockchain structure. So in a light chain paper, we model uh, the blockchain as a stack, as a stack of uh, four layers of protocols following, following some uh, earlier literatures on, on the blockchain. And those are network layer, consensus layer, storage layer, and view layer. Uh, so uh, network layer uh, concerns with dissemination of new transactions and blocks in the system and in the existing blockchain, if I have a new transaction, I need to uh, broadcast it using the network layer in an unstructured uh, way, uh, normally completely uh, topology agnostic uh, in, um, manner. So I broadcast it to some set of nodes that I just know in the system normally ad hoc set of nodes, and they do the same thing uh, if they follow the protocol, and the transaction reaches uh, hopefully every node in the system. This is unstructured, and if you have a system of n nodes, then in order to uh, write a transaction in, into the uh, blockchain, you need at least again, the exchange of O n uh, many nodes, uh, sorry, O n many messages. And um, then a node receives your transaction and hopefully it uh, wants to participate in the block generation decision making. So it uh, uh, puts your collected transaction into the uh, um, a, a block structure that it has and it completes that block. And then uh, it, it moves to the next stage to make a block out of it. And a uh, consensus layer of the blockchain is the layer that uh, is taking care of generating new blocks out of the transactions. And consensus layer is influence related, meaning that in the existing blockchains, of course, meaning that the more you have uh, hashing power in Bitcoin or the more you have stakes in the proof of a stake uh, based approach like um, Ethereum, etc. Uh, you can uh, have more influence on the block generation decision making. This is a sort of voting that the more you have some specific influence in the system, the more uh, vote you, the more power you have uh, to support your vote. Uh, if you want to have a very uh, brief summary of the consensus spectrum, existing uh, state of the art consensus spectrums, uh, we can. Um, uh, consider them from two axes of fairness and uh, communication complexity. In terms of fairness, it means that when you run a node in, in the blockchain, what, what are the odds? How much uh, it, it is likely for you to uh, participate in the next block uh, generation decision making? And then there is this uh, communication complexity, meaning that for uh, every block or transaction, how many messages should be exchanged in the system in order for that block to get committed to the blockchain? 
Uh, and we have proof of work, which uh, has the minimum communication complexity uh, compared to the other, so, but it, it has also the, the minimum fairness. So the more you have hashing power uh, in the system, you can independently support your uh, votes um, stronger than the rest. And then we have the proof of stake. Uh, we have the delegated Byzantine agreement, which is very similar to the parliamentary democracy. And then we have the uh, Byzantine agreement based, uh, or, or sometimes they also call DFT based um, a consensus that is like the full democracy in the system, but uh, of course it comes at a very uh, higher communication complexity. We revisit this spectrum once we also introduce the light chain and the spot where we contributed to this uh, spectrum later. Uh, then once you uh, once the consensus layer goes over the protocol and that protocol can be uh, independent, like the uh, uh, Bitcoin to, to the most extent that it generates a proof of work or it can be a, a, a decentralized protocol. Once the consensus protocol is done, then every node uh, has the new uh, block, uh, the, the newly generated block, and they can commit that to their instance of the shared replicated database. Consensus, by the way, uh, is not about making uh, every node to have a, an instance of a block. It is about committing that block to the blockchain. So a, a node may not have an instance of a block, but it uh, still uh, can uh, contribute to the consensus, but by making sure that it uh, commits that block to the blockchain. And uh, also this is something that we will talk about that uh, in, in a few moments. Uh, then uh, there is the storage layer of the blockchains that uh, t takes care of um, uh, storing these new blocks uh, and, and maintaining all the blocks and providing some sort of query over the blocks, which in the existing blockchains, uh, if you have B blocks in the system, the storage uh, grows linearly uh, or B uh, with, with the blocks. And this is very expensive. Uh, why? Because um, in uh, Bitcoin, at, at the time that uh, we were uh, um, preparing light chain presentation, it was 200 gigabytes in Bitcoin to, to have a, a storage of all the uh, existing blocks. Uh, and it is growing over the time. And finally, it is the view layer. And view layer is just a sort of uh, a table of identifier of the nodes. They ID normally the public key, their balance, and also some other metadata. And uh, basically, what is a view layer in, in, in its uh, general term? It is, it, it is considered as an empty table in the beginning and then once the blocks are arriving one after another, uh, the, the view table is updated based on the transactions in the blocks. So if a new node wants to construct uh, the view layer of the blockchain from the scratch, it needs to download all the blocks from the genesis to the rest. And genesis was some empty specific block which uh, everyone would uh, easily verify that and they can then verify the rest of the blocks. Uh, and build up this um, uh, view layer uh, of the blockchain and uh, then know, uh, let's say, the balance of other nodes or the state of other nodes in the system. There is also another problem in the blockchain, which is probabilistic for the solving approach, meaning that uh, if uh, two blocks point uh, to a single block as, as the previous block and uh, they, then they generate a fork, like this example, then the blockchain, uh, existing blockchains normally accept the longest chain as the main chain. And so it puts several chains and several par, uh, sub, uh, subset of nodes into some sort of rivalry to compete with each other over the longest chain. And so then uh, the notion of committing a transaction to the blockchain is no longer a problem, but having that over the main chain is a problem that uh, we also consider to, to solve it in, in the light chain. So considering uh, this uh, blockchain uh, architecture and also the existing um, um, blockchains downsides, uh, we propose light chain, which is the first fail communication and storage efficient and fork free blockchain. 
It has the communication complexity of all log n, meaning that in a system of n nodes, uh, in order to make a new block or transaction committed to the blockchain, you need to have only uh, the message complexity of O log n across all the uh, system. And it is very uh, efficient, considering that you have million, uh, a million of nodes in the system, then instead of 1 million messages, it is 20 messages. So it is a, a huge win for the communication complexity. And in terms of a storage complexity, Lightchain provides a uniform storage complexity over all the nodes, so it distributes all the blocks over the node, so no node is in charge of storing the entire blockchain, that 200 gigabytes. If you map that to the Bitcoin, then it would be a storage of, let's say, 30, gigabyte, 30 megabyte per node instead of uh, 200 gigabytes. And it provides direct retrieval of a state in of a node in low uh, O log N message complexity, meaning that instead of reading all the blocks from the Genesis block up to the current tail of the blockchain, I can just query the light chain and find out that uh, what is the state or balance of other node in the system without uh, the need to follow and track the ledger. And it, as we showed this also, it remains safe even under the corrupted majority of nodes. So where um, the other blockchains um, break and because of the uh, corrupted majority, like for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum, light chain is still remains safe. Uh, and also we propose an analytic framework for the light chain in the paper that uh, proves its safety, lightness, and availability. Also we implemented light chain in a skip sim uh, a simulator at a larger scale to show its safety, lightness, and availability. And also we implemented the proof of concept of light chain in Google Cloud Platform uh, to capture its running time. Uh, so in light chain, uh, starting from the network layer, we established the blockchain over a, a, a distributed hash table or in a specific skip graph based distributed hash table. And uh, what is a skip graph or uh, DHT in general? Uh, in DHT, every node knows a few other nodes based on some formulation, some algorithm. And then uh, th those many nodes are normally logarithmic in, in, in terms of the complexity. Uh, so uh, in a system of n node, as a node, I know only uh, log n many, o log n many nodes. And then using those, uh, every node can deterministically search for uh, every other node in the system. So I can search for that and realize that whether that other node in the system is available or not. And uh, having more details uh, in, in a skip graph, it would be uh, uh, th those those uh, nodes that I know are my neighbor uh, is, is uh, are my neighbors, and uh, then I I keep them in, in in a table that is called the lookup table of that node, and every node is identified with two identifiers, numerical ID and name ID, and in our approach, both of them are hash of the public key of the node. So uh, in, in instead of pushing something to the system, uh, broadcasting something uh, as of in the existing blockchains, in the uh, light chain, we are using uh, some pooling approach that everyone can search for something. And then uh, that is done in uh, all big O log N, which is an improvement from O N to uh, big O log N. Uh, and one more uh, thing is that why we are using hashing in order to pro, uh, reduce the influence of adversarial nodes on uh, adoptively construct these lookup tables and decide to which node they should get connected. When we are using hashing, uh, using a collision resistant hash function, it means that we put all the nodes into this uh, some sort of ballot and then we draw uh, randomly with a uniform chance for every node, the neighbors that it should get connected to them in the skip graph overlay. So we reduce the influence of adversarial nodes in the system. And we have some probability analysis for that in the paper. Uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, at the network layer, we provide a skip graph uh, DHT, but it is not only for the peers, we also do that for the blocks and transactions. Uh, so uh, we established two uh, skip graphs. One skip graph or one DHT is uh, among the peers, these gray tablets. 
And then another skip graph on top of this skip graph, which is for the transactions or blocks. So not only as a peer, I can query for other peers in the system, but I can also query for uh, other transactions or blocks. And each, uh, as uh, I will uh, elaborate on this, we assign each subset of the transactions or blocks to a subset of peers so that no peer needs to uh, store everything, but they can retrieve that very efficiently. Uh, having said so, uh, in, in light chain, instead of having the blockchain central, uh, sorry, the blockchain consolidated on a single node uh, as a database and replicating that database, we have a distributed database of the blocks and transactions uh, where, uh, as you can see, some nodes have, let's say, block two, some nodes have block eight, some nodes have block seven. Uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, once I, uh, let's say, have block one, then I can search for Genesis block because in the block one, in its previous field, uh, there is the hash uh, value of the Genesis and I can search for that and I can, found, uh, and I can find the Genesis block in the system. Uh, and uh, even better if, let's say, I only know block 12, which is the latest block in the system, and I'm acting at this peer, then I can keep searching for the previous block, previous block, previous block, until I found the genesis block. So I no longer need to store the entire blockchain. Uh, and uh, this might be a, a slightly uh, complex uh, concept, but uh, we elaborate this in the paper. Uh, we provide uh, searching for the uh, numerical IDs and name IDs. Remember that each node in the graph has two identifiers. So uh, we uh, assign the name ID of each uh, block and nu numerical ID of each block based on some sort of formulation. In a specific numerical ID of each block corresponds to hash of its previous block. So I have block one. Uh, it's uh, hash of its previous is Genesis. If I search for the numerical ID of Genesis, I find the peer that uh, has this Genesis block. And I can do this then for uh, any block that I know, and I traverse the blockchain downward. I, I, let's say I have block three, search for block two, I found block two, I have block two, I uh, search for block one, and I find block one, and so on and so forth. We also, for the first time, enable nodes to also search the blockchain forward. So uh, how, how we are doing this, we assign name ID of each node uh, in a way that uh, it, it, it uh, has the, uh, um, if, if, I, if I want to put it into formulation, we assign the name ID of each node uh, also, uh, for, for example, this genesis as its uh, hash value. So if I uh, search for name ID of the, uh, for example, in, in this uh, picture, if I want to, uh, if I have block two and I search for the name ID of the block two, then I find the um, uh, block three, which has the, the uh, hash value of block two as its name ID. So then uh, as the numerical ID of each block, we assign numerical ID as the hash value of the block and as the, uh, sorry, ha hash value of the previous block, and then as the name ID of the block, we assign the name ID as the hash value of the block itself. So we, we assign two pointers. And using this, if I have only the Genesis block, then I can search for Genesis block and find the uh, block one that points to Genesis block, and I can do this, uh, follow this forward means, and uh, literally uh, tra traverse the entire blockchain in a forward way. Uh, coming to the consensus layer, we propose proof of validation, uh, which maximizes the famous roughly as good as the uh, parliament, uh, as, as good as the full democracy that the Byzantine agreement based blockchains, but uh, at a very, very uh, cheaper communication complexity. So communication complexity of uh, proof of work is O1. You do not need to uh, do anything, uh, any communication to uh, generate proof of work. That is O1. Uh, but in proof of validation, you need to do uh, logarithmically many 
uh, queries in the system, which is uh, much more better than proof of stake uh, or, uh, the, or delegated Byzantine agreements or the Byzantine agreement. And it maximizes the fairness in a way that each node has a uniform chance to be selected as the voter over the next block and that is completely independent of its influence in the system, like its hashing power or its state. We consider none of them in, in the voting power of a node. And how does the proof of validation work? Uh, if a node, uh, let's say, has a new transaction, like X wants to pay C, let's say, coins to Y, then it generates some sort of header for that transaction, the previous pointer of that transaction, uh, its identifier and the contribution, and then it needs to find some validators for its transaction. And how uh, does that happen? It takes the hash of this header of the transaction, concatenated with some counter i, and uh, searches for that. Let's say that concatenated with zero, and, and we show what happens if we do more. Then what does it mean taking hash concatenated with something? It generates some randomized, uh, uniformly randomized identifier, which corresponds to drawing the, the validator from a set of, uh, from the set of all the nodes in the system uniformly without any biased distribution. And it finds the uh, address of the validator. It searches for the validator using the search for uh, numerical ID in a skip graph. And then uh, as the result of the search, it has the address of all the nodes on the search path to this validator alongside with a search proof that shows that this search really happened. And this is a temper proof authenticated search proof that we use guard in a specific in, in our light chain. So it knows that who are on the search path and whether the search is correct or not. And then uh, the eighth node on the, uh, uh, sorry, the last node on the uh, search path is the validator. For the eighth search, it is the eighth validator. And then uh, it sends the transaction to the validator directly and validator checks whether the transaction is sound, if it follows the causality or not, whether the transaction has enough contribution to, to pay the fees and balances, et cetera. And, um, whether in, in, in those terms the transaction is correct and if the transaction is sound and correct meaning that it follows the causality and also it uh, has enough balance uh, at the owner side to, to, to proceed then it gets some initial informal acceptance from the uh, validator so this validator confirms uh, and uh, the node does that for alpha many uh, times for alpha many validators. So it in increases this counter from zero to alpha and searches for those validators. It sends the uh, transaction to those validators and they validate that. And um, similarly, so the, the first validator confirms, the second validator confirms, the third validator may reject that and the rest may confirm. And why this third validator may reject that? Because this may be malicious. We do not need in light chain to, uh, for all the validators to confirm, but we need the node to contact alpha many nodes, receive the, the validation of T many of them, and then proceed. And we show that we, do, uh, we, we determine alpha and T in a way that no malicious node can find uh, T many uh, malicious uh, validators in the system to pass the initial or final validation. So, uh, after it receives the initial validation from the uh, validators, then it generates the entire transaction uh, and um, with all the fields, and it signs that and uh, adds the fees, also the, the payment of the fees to all the validators who agreed with this transaction, and then it sends the transaction to those validators. And then... Uh, what happens next is the final validation phase where validators take a uh, closer look at the transaction. They scrutinize the transaction based on the current state of the blockchain. Uh, again, considering the, uh, sorry, my screen left. Yeah, it, it's soundness, whether it follows the causality. 
uh, whether the owner has enough balance to, to cover the fees and whether the transaction is authenticated or not, meaning that if I uh, generate a transaction, whether that transaction really comes from me or someone masquerades me in the blockchain. And those can be verified using the uh, digital signature on the transaction. Once all of them passed, uh, then the validator signs the transaction, hash of the transaction, and sends the signature to the owner. So owner has too many signatures on the uh, on its transaction, on the hash of its transaction. So the transaction passes the final validation. And after that, it sends the validated transaction with valid signatures to all the uh, validators. So each validator only has a copy of the transaction and numerical ID of the transaction in the skip graph is set to the hash of it and name ID is set to the uh, hash of the previous block in, in the, uh, sorry, the, yes, the, the, the previous block that it points to that. And uh, yes, the transactions in Lightchain are pointing to the previous block, uh, to a, a block as a previous block on the ledger. This is to provide some sort of causality. We discuss it in the paper in more details, but uh, in, in the sense of time, I am going to skip over that. So it, uh, then, each of these validators and also the transaction owner insert the transaction as a node in the skip graph of the nodes or uh, sorry, in the skip graph of the blocks and transactions, which we call it SGB. So the transaction gets accessible to all the nodes in the system. So then uh, every node can search for the new transaction if uh, the node wants to generate a new block. And how a node can search for a new transaction all the transactions that are coming after a block has uh, the uh, hash of that block as their name ID, as we elaborated on that earlier. So in order for my transaction to be seen by other nodes, I uh, uh, should uh, set the uh, name ID of my transaction as the hash of the most recent block in the blockchain, or in other words, as, as the current tail of the blockchain. And then every node can search for the uh, name ID of the hash of the uh, current tail of the blockchain and find the new set of the transactions that are all pointing to that. And then it, 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 it would be similar to this. So all of these transactions, each uh, hosting, each is uh, hosted on uh, a different node, all pointing to the uh, current tail of the blockchain and searching for name ID of this block uh, results in address of their owners, all the peers that own this transaction. So every node can retrieve those in each transaction in login because this is uh, our DHT. And then uh, once uh, all these transactions are uh, found and, and they are uh, captured in a new block, then uh, um, they all transfer to a new block in the blockchain and their the, uh, replicas are informed that these transactions have been uh, placed in the new block. So you are free to drop the replicas and they drop the replicas of the, those transactions. So in Lightchain, the nodes uh, clean after themselves after they are done with their uh, transactions. Uh, finally, how does Lightchain do with the, uh, at the consensus layer with the forking mechanism? Well, Lightchain follows a fork-free mechanism, meaning that uh, assume that there are two blocks in the uh, system, this block and this block, block one and block two, both are getting validated at the same time uh, and uh, concurrently. Uh, so, uh, and both are pointing to block one as, uh, so, sorry, uh, there is a typo in this slide, I should set this as block zero. They, they all point to block zero as um, the, uh, the previous block. Because uh, in light chain, every node can search for something and find whether or not uh, th there is a new block or, uh, for, for example, who owns this block and uh, those attributes can be retrieved from the system. Uh, so uh, 
the moment that there are two blocks available in the system and both of them are retrievable using the name ID of blo uh, this uh, previous block, block zero in this example, a node can decide there is a fork and there are two blocks or more. I should follow the block with the minimum hash value. The, 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 uh, in, in this example, if hash of block one is less than block, hash of block two, then the node follows the block one, uh, the block one as the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, follows the uh, maximum hash at the fork. Uh, I should fix this slide. Uh, in any case, there is a decision, deterministic decision that they, they, they follow the block with, with the specific hash and then uh, they build up the transactions upon that. And because block with a specific hash, minimum or maximum, has a deterministic decision behind that, uh, there isn't any probabilistic fork in the system that nodes should only follow, let's say, the longest chain. There isn't any uh, notion of longest chain, and all the nodes follow a deterministic uh, for, uh, branch of any fork in, in the system, so they, they, they can easily identify whether or not this is a legitimate branch or not. Uh, finally, in terms of the performance results, uh, we simulated uh, the light chain first in SkipSim, which is a skip graph simulator. With 10,000 nodes uh, over 48 hours each uh, and, and over 100,000 transactions. And we did this uh, for 100 randomized topologies. So each of these three, uh, all these three features, uh, 10,000 nodes, 48 hours, and 100,000 transactions, these uh, correspond to a single light chain system. And we did this for 100,000, uh, sorry, for 100 randomized uh, topologies. And by randomized topology, we mean that uh, the connectivity of the nodes, their uh, churn, their arrival or departure uh, from and to the system, and their uh, attributes are chosen randomly. So uh, we wanted to neutralize this uh, effect of, let's say, the, the connectivity links in the system, etc. And we simulated that under the churn of real Bitcoin system. And what is the churn? Churn is the uh, a, a sort of probability, the probabilistic distribution that uh, uh, models the arrivals and departures or offline and online states of the nodes in the system. And we did that for the adversarial fractions of 16%, 33%, and 51%. And why these are uh, important? 16% is the size of the largest pool of uh, Bitcoin nodes that uh, has been uh, formally identified up to the day. And 33% is beyond the threshold that BFT uh, or uh, proof of stake consensus can tolerate. So essentially when we simulate for this, it means that already those uh, uh, consensus uh, approaches are broken. Then, then we move to 33% of adversarial fraction. And 51% of adversarial power fraction means that uh, the, the corresponds to the situation where Bitcoin uh, breaks, since Bitcoin operates uh, under 50% uh, of uh, adversarial po uh, power. Uh, and in light chain, there isn't any notion of adversarial power because all the nodes are equally likely in, in the block generation decision making. So adversarial power means that how many nodes the adversary can control. And uh, in, in terms of safety, this is the adversarial success probability in forking a, a, a block in the blockchain or in validating an invalid or adversarial transactional block. In other words, finding too many uh, legitimate validators through proof of validation out of alpha many trials that it can make. And as uh, seen here, for each of these adversarial fractions, there are some values of alpha that the adversarial success probability drops to essentially zero, but uh, cryptographically negligible value in, uh, in, in, a, a, as the T grows. And we have those formulations available also in our paper, how to decide on this T and alpha given that we know F. And there is one interesting thing about the values of T and alpha is that 
these two are totally independent of the system size. So uh, once these, uh, they, they assume that the, the system size grows enough, is big enough in, in, in the scale of current blockchains, but uh, they are completely independent of the system size. So once, once you set the adversarial fraction assumption uh, or, or parameter, then the, uh, both T and alpha are valid, uh, independent, independent of the system size that we are uh, operating on. And then in terms of safety and liveness, we observe a very interesting uh, fact uh, solving these two uh, equations together. We realize that if the adversarial fraction in, in light chain goes beyond 50%, then light chain is no longer live. And what does it mean light chain is no longer live? It means that Light chain stops working. No one can find too many validators for their transactions that can sign the transaction using the formulations that we provide. So it ceases to work. So is it a good feature or a bad feature? We believe this is a good feature. And why this is a good feature? Because then other blockchains break, for example, adversarial uh, fraction in Bitcoin uh, grows and Bitcoin breaks, then it, it, it continues its uh, corrupted state. So it gets corrupted and it is continued. But in life chain, the moment that it uh, gets corrupt, uh, sorry, the moment that uh, the adversarial uh, uh, nodes in number grow uh, up to a point, then uh, the life chain is not getting corrupted, but it ceased working, it has stopped. And th at that point, uh, there, there can be some bootstrapping mechanism that nodes can find the malicious nodes using the blacklisting, as we explained in the paper, and then bootstrap the system by uh, blacklisting the malicious nodes and restarting the system from its uh, current tail uh, and continue its, uh, its work. And as shown here, it can provide the safety and liveness uh, for 16% and 33%, and even be showed that up to 50% uh, of uh, less than 50%, it can provide both safety and, li and liveness. And what uh, this figure corresponds to is that, for example, for the uh, adversarial success probability of 33%, there is a value of alpha that is 144 independent of the system size, that uh, the adversarial success probability drops exponentially and essentially reaches zero in experiments uh, as the value of t grows. So if I want to put it into practical numbers, if we assume that we want to operate light chain on top of Ethereum, uh, in, uh, sorry, instead of Ethereum on the same setup, instead of uh, involving all the nodes in uh, which are definitely more than 144 on, on generating a new transaction or block, light chain needs, uh, in Lightchain, a node needs to contact at most 144 nodes and get the signature of at most, uh, sorry, at least 60 nodes out of those 144 nodes. And these nodes are selected based on the formulations inside the proof of validation. And then it guarantees that the light chain is safe and live. And so no adversarial node can contact 144 nodes and get uh, around, uh, sorry, sorry, more than 60, uh, 60 or more validators to sign its uh, transaction among the uh, malicious nodes that it owns. And we also did some simulation over the uh, Google Cloud Platform. We implemented light chain uh, proof of concept with a system size of 1,000 nodes uh, and, and we used the free tier on, on Google Cloud. So we needed to uh, run on some uh, resource constraint nodes uh, with 2.2 gigahertz single core CPU and 3.9 gigabytes of memory. And each node uh, generates one transaction per second for 1,000 transactions, totally a node, and then uh, because we have 1,000 nodes and each generating 1,000 transactions, so it is 1 million transactions in total. We needed to sequentialize a lot of operations uh, because of the, the nodes being single core. So the, the transaction time that we report is uh, its bare minimum and at its uh, 
one of the least efficient implementations because of the resource constraint environment that we were deploying on. But of course, we envision even better transaction time uh, than seven to 82 seconds on average. So seven was for uh, adversary of fraction of 16 percent and 82 seconds was for the adversary of fraction of 144 uh, seconds. But it is uh, at, at this scale even is promising compared to the transaction time in uh, the existing blockchains like Bitcoin. And uh, here we are showing the uh, average block formation time, the time that it takes for a node to collect all the transactions and put them into a block as the, the number of transactions in the block grows. And average block validation time, the number of uh, transactions, uh, the, the, the total time that a, a, a node needs to, uh, a validator needs to spend on validating a new block uh, or transaction, uh, sorry, a block as the number of transactions grow. And finally, the average block size in, in uh, light chain as the number of transactions grows. And each of them are for the uh, fraction of adversarial nodes of 16% and 33%. Of course, we didn't simulate for 51% as we simulated in a skip sim because at that point, light chain stops working. Uh, so we're going to capture these numbers. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, we, uh, in Lightchain, we investigated the blockchain's communication, storage, and decentral uh, decentralization and consistency in efficiencies. We proposed Lightchain, which is the first communication and storage efficient and fork free blockchain. Its communication complexity is O log N, its storage complexity is O B over N. It has a fork free mechanism and uh, there isn't any adversarial fraction bound for safety that we, we say that light chain is safe up to this point. Light chain has a tweakable adversarial uh, fraction bound that uh, then we can uh, decide on the op uh, operational parameters. So it remains safe even when Bitcoin and Ethereum break. And uh, I want to also uh, acknowledge our prototyping team of interns, uh, Nazir Mayal, Shadi Sam Hamdan, and Ali Uskan Shahin. Uh, they are uh, working under uh, the supervision of me, Professor Kupchan, Professor Uskasov, in and the Distributed Systems and Reliable Network Distant Laboratory in Koch University, and they they implemented the prototype of the uh, light chain in both SkipSim and also uh, the uh, proof of concept of light chain. And we could successfully publish three papers with them, uh, demo papers on uh, our, our prototyping in uh, ICBC 2020, and also the SkipSim paper, our simulator in uh, ICBC 2020. And we recently got accepted for publication in, for our uh, skip graph middle wave implementation, the uh, skip graph layer of the light chain uh, in the SRDS uh, 2020 that will be held in, I think, September. And uh, thank you for uh, your time and consideration and attending my presentation. It was my honor to present at this venue, and uh, please feel free to uh, uh, contact me in uh, my email and my LinkedIn for further uh, communications or discussions of a light chain. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That, that was a very uh, nice presentation. <laughs>